Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to the channel. So uh, what I wanna talk to you guys about in today's video is that I just came up with a very interesting idea for a brand new series on the channel. And here's the thing guys, so I'm obviously a long-term investor. This channel is focused on long-term investing, but a lot of times people ask me for my opinion on what's going on in the stock market here in kind of the short to medium term. So I thought it would be fun to, about a week before the upcoming month, do an update video with you guys where I share with you my opinion on what's going on in the stock market right now and where prices are trading and how I feel about everything that's going on and also talk to you about some of the stocks that are on my radar that I'm actually thinking about investing in if the price is right and depending on certain criteria. So kind of like a proactive approach to being ready for any opportunities that may be presenting themselves here in the short to kind of medium term. So I'm actually very excited about this series. I really hope that you guys enjoy it. I feel like it's more of a personal kind of video between you and me where I just share my random thoughts and, and honest opinions on everything that's happening here right now. So uh, with that said, we've got a lot to cover today. So let's go ahead and start with a quick update on what's happening here in the stock market and how I feel about it. And then we'll transition over to what stocks I'm currently interested in. Okay, now as you guys know, the stock market had a big and very sudden crash at the start of the year with the Dow Jones falling by almost 40% from the highs. Unfortunately though, for someone like me that actually likes to buy stocks when they're going down, the market quickly jumped off of the bottom in late March for what has been a pretty big rally of almost 30%. Now, it is technically still down over 20% from the all-time highs, but these prices just aren't as appealing as they once were when it was down almost double that amount in March, and I'm sure most of you out there are probably feeling the same way. Now, in my opinion, this has been a V-shaped recovery in the stock market that should really not be happening right now. The government and the Fed has been pumping a ton of money into the stock market as I detailed in one of my recent videos, and the result is that the stock market has shot up uh, uh, very quickly despite the economy getting absolutely destroyed because of the lockdowns and the shutdowns that we've put in place all around the world in an effort to fight off that global uh, health issue. But as a result, in just the past five weeks, we've lost over 26.5 million jobs in the US, which is by far the most jobless claims we've ever seen in history and is also more than all of the jobs that we've gained since the Great Recession. So basically all the jobs that we've gained since then in, in over a decade, we've already wiped out in just a matter of weeks. That's pretty crazy. Now, the rate has at least been trending downward over the last few weeks and the assumption is that once we start to open up the economy again, we'll keep that trend going downward as more and more people return to work. But no matter how you slice it, we're dealing with shocking numbers here as insured unemployment has now risen to around 23% according to Capital Economics, which is only slightly below the record high of 25% during the Great Depression. And the return of jobs is still based on the assumption that a lot of these, or like most of these companies, don't go out of business. And sure, the government has been giving out a lot of grants and loans, but what happens to the businesses that require people to actually be close to each other, like the theaters and the theme parks and the restaurants and the gyms and the travel industry and so on? If this global issue doesn't get under control and people don't feel safe enough to kind of go outside and return to normal life, all the loans in the world aren't gonna solve the problem of negative cash flows and rising debt from a drastically changed economy. And that ultimately means less cash in people's pockets and less spending in what has always been for the United States, uh, for the most part, a consumer dominated economy. And look, I'm more optimistic than most. I don't think that this is the end of the world like a lot of people are trying to make it out to be. I, I do think that this is a big problem, but I think it's one that will eventually go away. And over the long term, I'm still very confident about my investments and the choices that I've made in the stock market. But to pretend like the stock market deserves to be trading at these levels with the Dow Jones basically around the same levels that it was around a year ago, it's just crazy. It's clearly at these levels because of the actions taken by the government and the Fed. And while I personally do think that they were needed, and it might actually keep us from retesting those March lows. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. I'm just saying that that's kind of the reality of the situation. That's my opinion. Uh, but even though I think we might not get down that much, I think still dropping a few thousand points from here is a very real possibility. So having said that, what am I planning to do myself here? Well, the way I see it, there's really two scenarios for what I think will happen in May or in the upcoming months. Now, uh, on one hand, I think that we could see the market drop heavily because 
everything is kind of overvalued in my opinion. And the other scenario is that I think things could stay relatively the same because of the actions being taken by the government and the Fed. I don't personally think that we're going to see the market take off, so I'm not really counting on that scenario, but these other two I think are very real possibilities. Well, in both scenarios, I'm most attracted myself to either high quality names that do admittedly trade for a premium, but also carry very little risk. So if things were to kind of stay the same, these are still good long-term investments. If the market drops and kind of drags them down a little bit, uh, you get a better valuation for great companies that would ideally not have any exposure or not much exposure to this global issue and wouldn't take as big of a business hit. And then in the other group is the big dividend payers. And the reason I like those is because over the long term, you get to collect dividends. So if things stay the same, you're still collecting those dividends. And if the market falls, well, then the prices drop. And as long as they're still paying those dividends, you would get a higher yield. Well, starting with the higher quality names for those, I would really want the overall market to tumble and drag them down a bit because uh, admittedly, their prices are pretty high right now. But if that happens, I will be looking at four stocks in particular that are all mostly internet and software based. So they have very little exposure to the global issue. And they also have unbelievably stable and reliable businesses with just as phenomenal balance sheets to easily get them through any economic downturn, which obviously we're facing a really big one right now. And so there's uh, out of those four big names, two are already my largest holdings. And then the other two are ones that I would love to buy brand new positions in. And they're actually already starting to look kind of attractive to me. The two that I own though are Microsoft and Amazon. And unfortunately they are currently very high right now with Microsoft only being down about 10% from a record high while Amazon is basically there already having soared by almost 30% this year alone at a time when so many other stocks have been getting crushed. But that's because they're actually a huge beneficiary of everything that's going on with everyone choosing to shop online rather than risk going outside to retail stores. In fact, that created such a big uptick in demand that they had to hire close to 100,000 more employees at a time when clearly most other businesses are unfortunately either firing or furloughing many of their employees. As a result, analysts are actually projecting sales growth in both the first and second quarter of over 20% each, which is just insane considering how deep of a recession we're in right now. And so many companies are obviously seeing sales just completely plummet, especially in the second quarter which is very likely. So for Amazon stock to dip here, I just don't think it's going to happen unless the broader market really takes a big hit. And even then, I don't think it would affect Amazon by a very considerable amount, but if it does, I would definitely be all over it. Now, on the other hand, the two new ones that I would love to buy are Google and Facebook, and they actually look a lot more reasonable to me at these levels. In fact, Google is still trading below the midpoint of their 52 week range, which actually isn't as great as it sounds because it's an incredibly stable stock. So the spread from the lows to the highs is usually a lot smaller than most other companies out there. But when you think about how many people must be using Google services right now, like search and even YouTube, I think they're very likely to perform very well throughout the next few years, despite everything that's going on. Although it's also very likely that advertising spending is being cut dramatically right now, but at the same time, my gut tells me that those cuts will happen more so on legacy mediums like TV and others, while digital or internet-based advertising will see a much smaller drop because it's better targeted and more efficient for the money, which is very important right now, although I do still think that it will be kind of substantial in terms of the cuts. Either way though, the future is clearly digital advertising and with Google being the market leader, I think it's a great stock to own for the long term. Speaking of which, as the second largest digital advertising company only behind Google, Facebook is also looking pretty good considering what you get. It's actually still down around 18% from their highs. And when you look at their valuation, they are by far the cheapest of my favorite big four companies with a five year PG ratio of just barely above one while the others are substantially higher. You also get a growing and very profitable business with very high margins at close to $20 billion of net income last year alone. And I'd be very surprised if there aren't even more people using their Facebook and Instagram platforms right now with Instagram in specific seeing a ton of growth every year. And on top of all of that, you also get an insanely strong balance sheet that can easily get them through any recession 
progression that we go through and still set them up well for future acquisitions and more development projects of their own as their cash and short-term investments alone can easily cover all of their total liabilities and still leave them with literally tens of billions of dollars left over. That's insane. So again, I don't really see my favorite four kind of giants like best in class companies uh, dipping very much here in May, but if they do, I would definitely be all over it and I, I'd be willing to basically purchase any of them. And especially in the case of like Google and Facebook, even some small dips of like five to 10% might be enough to get me interested to just kind of jump in and, and dip my toes in those. Uh, and by the way, Visa is another uh, like big foundational stock that I really like for the long term. But uh, the only issue with that one is that I've already purchased like a huge amount of it. I, I bought it for the first time during this crash. And when it got down to those March lows, I went so heavy on it. Like I just tapped into my cash reserves and I went so heavy in it. Uh, Visa is already my fourth largest stock and I didn't even own it until this year. So <laughs> that just tells you, I own a lot of stocks in my portfolio. So to go from zero to number four, that just gives you an idea of how heavily I bought it when it was at those like March lows. I went so heavy in it. And, and so I'm already up a pretty good amount on it. So I'd kind of, because I already own so much and I'm, I'm doing well on it, I'd rather be looking for opportunities elsewhere um, at this time. Okay, now let's move on to the big dividend payers. And for these ones, you might be asking, well, is there any stocks here that you kind of already like at today's prices? Well, yeah, there's actually three big dividend stocks that have me really interested. And uh, these ones have really big growth histories. They generate a ton of cash flow. So I think their dividends will likely be grown in, in the future. And they also have pretty low valuations as well. The only issue with these ones is that they do have a lot more risk, but I'll talk about that as we go through it. So let's just kind of quickly run through these and then we'll wrap up the video. Okay, now starting with the first one, I still think that AT&T is reasonably priced at these levels. In fact, I actually just picked up a few more shares the other day. And ever since I started buying it around the end of 2018, I've always been a net buyer of AT&T in the $20 range, which it currently sits in right now. And that's around the same price that the stock was trading for about a decade ago, which is pretty crazy. Now there's definitely good reason for that. AT&T is a very risky stock for its horrendous balance sheet that carries almost a hundred and 50 billion dollars of long-term debt that sometimes gives me nightmares to be honest and it's also been losing a scary number of cable tv subscribers over the years as more people continue to cut the cord now on one hand this global issue means more people are stuck at home which might translate to more of them keeping their service for entertainment but i think any positives there will be completely wiped out by the fact that we're in a very deep recession right now and cable TV prices are just way too expensive compared to streaming services like Netflix or Disney Plus. So I think the end result will still be more losses there. Now they are launching their own uh, streaming service called HBO Max to compete with them, but there's no question that they missed a huge opportunity by not having already launched it during the start of these lockdowns, which would have given them a huge boost in subscriber numbers as we saw was the case with both Netflix and Disney Plus, and it would have really set them up well for the future with a large subscriber foundational kind of base that they could build off of. But as it stands, the service isn't launching until the end of May, so we'll have to see if they are still able to get a boost at that time. But with all of that negativity said, the reason I chose to invest in them is because they generate a ton of free cash flow that not only helps them service their debt, but also pay a gigantic dividend thanks to their dominance in very lucrative markets like wireless telephone, which has 5G ramping up, and of course, high-speed internet that practically everyone needs these days and usually pay high premiums for. But again, for me, it's that dividend. As long as it yields over 7%, it's hard for me not to be a net buyer of the stock. And while I do think that it will be incredibly rough for them over these next couple of years as they struggle to transition their business, I think the reasonable payout ratio, the huge growth history of 35 consecutive years, and the consistently large cash flows will mean that I get to collect a really big dividend even if the stock continues to crash and I'm forced to hold it through the years of transition and eventual recovery. Which is one of the reasons why I love dividends because it makes it so much easier to be a long-term investor and hold a stock through any kind of pain when you're still able to collect a dividend through all of it. Now, uh, that's not the only dividend payer that I'm attracted to right now. I'm also considering adding to my 3M position. Still think it looks good at these levels, although admittedly I haven't purchased any new shares since those March lows, but that dividend is still sitting north of over 4%. At those levels, it's hard to ignore, especially with that gigantic growth history of over 60 years that 
barely any other companies can match. Now, the downside to 3M has always been their large exposure to the global macro economy, especially that country where this whole global issue originated, which has led to the stock crashing by over 40% from their 2018 highs. Now, I've been buying this stock mostly in the $130 range or less, so it is a bit above that at this moment, but thanks to their suppressed share price, not only has the dividend climbed to over 4%, but the valuation has also trended downward, which is something that I prefer. And as primarily a dividend investment for me, what I care most about is the sustainability of the dividend. So with substantial free cash flow generation and soaring sales in masks and other medical equipment because of everything that's going on, I don't think it's likely that a dividend cut will happen anytime soon. What I do think might happen though is in the upcoming earnings, if 3M gives some really weak guidance for the rest of the year, which I think is a very real possibility because of that really big exposure to the macro economy, then the stock could go down. And so that's, I'm actually kind of hoping for that to be honest, because that would drive the yield up and I'd be able to get shares at a lower price. But those are some of the things that I'll be kind of looking for with 3M throughout May, because they will be reporting uh, earnings, I believe soon. Okay, now finally, there is just one more stock that I am researching more right now, and it's actually Johnson & Johnson. I've been getting a little more attracted to this one over time, but I'll just keep my reasoning super like short and sweet because it's a pretty simple rationale. For one, they've been growing their dividend for almost 60 years in a row, just like 3M, and while the yield is a little low at less than 3%, uh, it, it does at least carry a very reasonable payout ratio, which when combined with their enormous cash flows, doing almost 20 billion in free cash flow last year alone, it looks very sustainable into the future. They also have a very diversified business through large consumer sales, gigantic pharmaceutical sales, and also very large medical device sales that not only help them generate that high cash flow, but also helps them easily survive any economic downturn with only a projected revenue drop this year of around 3%. And that's mostly because people are not visiting hospitals and having procedures done because of the lockdown. So there's a lot less demand for their medical devices. But once people start leaving their houses again and having procedures done, which I think will probably ramp up next year if I had to guess, uh, it should result in a pretty, pretty sizable pop for them as expected sales growth sits at almost 10% next year, which is pretty big growth for a company like Johnson & Johnson. They don't normally see that. And because of their gigantic size, they arguably have bigger scale than any other company out there that is competing to develop and manufacture a V-shot for that global issue, which could potentially lead to over a billion doses manufactured every year, according to CNBC. And I don't want to sound cruel in saying this because I do obviously feel bad just kind of talking about it, but the reality of the situation is that if this thing turns out to be a seasonal event where a lot of people are taking shots every year, that would obviously benefit J&J &J financially. And while that did lead to the stock surging to a record high this year, the fact of the matter is that the stock has already been suppressed for a while because of previous lawsuits and scandals, so even with the surge, the stock is still trading considerably cheaper than the sector. And speaking about the economy, J&J's balance sheet is still pretty healthy at the moment despite always making strategic acquisitions throughout its history, so you couple that with the cash flow and well-diversified business, and I think they're in pretty good shape to keep paying the dividend well throughout this economic recession. The only issue that I have myself is that I'm not a very big fan of the pharmaceutical industry, so I have very little exposure to it. Um, so it usually takes a pretty big dividend to get me excited about a stock, and with Johnson & Johnson yielding less than 3%, it's just not that high to get me really excited. But uh, if the price goes down a little more and that dividend yield climbs above 3%, I might actually dip my toes in them because I am becoming more and more um, attracted to J&J &J, uh, as time goes on. That's what I'm kind of finding. So anyway, uh, there you have it, guys. Those, those are the things that I'll be looking for here going into May and into the short kind of medium term with a kind of a long term, obviously, um, perspective and outlook for everything. But uh, what do you guys think? Let me know your thoughts down below. I hope you guys enjoy the new series, this, this new idea that I have. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know uh, your thoughts on any of these stocks. What stocks are you looking at into the next month? And even if you think stock prices are too high right now, um, what stocks would you be interested in if we did see the market kind of tumble and, and prices uh, get more attractive? I would love to hear your thoughts down below. And if you did enjoy the video, please consider hitting the like button. It really helps the channel and it means a lot to me. But I really appreciate all the support, guys. Stay safe out there and uh, I will talk to you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.